Hello and welcome everybody to Simply Cyber Live, the live stream interview podcast bringing cybersecurity industry practitioners to engage and share their perspective with you in a fun and engaging way. In this electrifying and intellectually stimulating episode, we're discussing and studying the evolving cybersecurity landscape and the multifaceted challenges it presents. Today, we're dialing up both the timeless battles we're all too familiar with, many of us, why we have gray in our hair, with the emerging front lines in the battle against cyber threats. And who better to navigate us through this complex terrain than a wicked, impressive practitioner in the field. This guy, Craig Connors, VP and CTO over at Cisco Security. I've had an opportunity to talk with Craig. Very impressive, wicked smart dude. You're going to love him. On top of that, Craig will be explaining HyperShield, the revolutionary new security architecture Cisco launched literally today. We talked about it in the Daily Cyber Threat Brief this morning. It was absolutely lit. I think you're going to love it. Craig's journey is nothing short of remarkable, a testament to the power of resilience and innovation, which is going to come up in a hot minute from the disciplined ranks of the U.S. Army. Thank you, Craig, for your service. Craig transitioned into the tech space where he has been a vanguard at Cisco, serving as the vice president and chief technology officer of security. Spoiler alert, they don't just hand those titles out. Craig is absolutely uh, deserving of that title and that role, and he's crushing it in that capacity. His insights have been sharpened over years of experience from the tactical focus of network security to the strategic oversight of uh, Cisco's security division. And Craig's story doesn't end there. His entrepreneurial spirit breathes life into the diverse ventures from the rhythmic heartbeats to Tolik Records to the adventurous depths of Aquanauts Dive Shop. Literally, this guy is a renaissance man. His expertise isn't just confined to the realm of cybersecurity either. He's got a confluence of diverse disciplines, each enriching the understanding of security in a hyper-connected world. Sit down, okay? Carrie, Gary, Zemeth, Alyssa M., Emilio Garcia, Viper, sit down, okay? because I want you not to have your socks or your shoes or your hair blown back on this one. He's a holder of 19 patents. You've heard it correct, 19. Craig's innovations have paved the way for advancements in network security, shaping the industry's approach to security, resilient communications. His vision is one of secure digital ecosystems where threats aren't just mitigated, but preempted. I love it, right? Pre, uh, like Basically proactive security. Can I get a double dose of that? So buckle up. As we dive deep with Craig into the cybersecurity landscape, we're going to unpack the classic, the current, and we're going to look across the horizon at challenges that are going to shape the near future for us. Okay, guys, it's not just a conversation. It's a journey into the future of cybersecurity guided, arguably, by one of the most forward-thinking leaders in the space. I can't wait. We encourage engagement, as many of you are familiar with. I see all the uh, blue badge emotes. Um, you know, Alfredo, Kimberly uh, from the couch. I can see it. Kimberly's probably off the couch right now. We encourage engage engagement and we want your thoughts. We want your questions. Okay. So if you want to share it, drop it in chat, right? We very much encourage it. And if you have a question for Craig, put a cue in front of it. So I know, so the mods can grab it. I will facilitate it to Craig. Uh, excuse me. To Yeah. To Craig. I don't know why I just had a brain melt there because I'll know it's for him. All right. Live on stage. So just get the engagement train started. Let me throw out, I'm doing polling today, guys, because I, I wanted to have some fun with it, okay? So I'm going to throw out our first polling question. So chat, listen up. If you could have one superpower, okay, to improve cybersecurity, what would you take? Would it be telepathy? Would it be time travel? Would it be super speed? Go ahead. If you're on YouTube, vote now. I'm just curious. What would you take if you could get a superpower? Like you just come down and get touched with the one telepathy, time travel, super speed to make cybersecurity easier or to drive cyber risk reduction or to just mess around and punk on threat actors. And while you're voting, grab a comfortable seat, perhaps a pen, paper, because Craig's going to be not dropping knowledge bombs on you and prepare to be inspired. If you're a squad member, like you know, Eric McKellen and Nerman, Chris Cahal, drop your Oprah emotes as usual so we can give Craig a nice Simply Cyber welcome and help me welcome Craig Connors to the show. Let's go get him. What's up, Craig? Oh, hold on, Craig. You, you, I know you're big, you're big with 19 packs. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, not... was, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you know what? You've done quite a bit, man. So, uh, you know, it's it's well deserved, obviously, well earned. Uh, I hope we have time to get into the patents, but um, you have a very impressive background, Craig. We all heard it in the read. Uh, but before we get into the meat of cybersecurity, right, and you just blow our brains back, um, I'd love to know your thoughts, right? 
pick a superpower, Craig. What are you doing? Telepathy, time travel, super speed for cybersecurity. I know you have yeah. kids and like, you know, they might want you to lean one way or the other. I mean, uh, for cybersecurity, it's got to be time travel, right? I mean, as perfect as we think we can be stopping threats, like what if my XDR could do time travel to do ransomware recovery? Like that's the greatest thing ever. So I, I think that's obvious. Yeah, you know, a hundred percent. Like, I, yeah, like we're looking for that button in the uh, in the um, in the MDR solution. Like, where's, where's the time <laughs> travel button? It looks like Chad agrees with you a hundred percent. Right now, we got uh, time travel at fifty-two percent. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that, Craig. So Craig, you've been around the industry in a variety of roles over the years, right? Can you share with us some of the significant shifts that you've seen in cybersecurity from your early career to now? Yeah. I mean, I think the world has changed around us, right? Mm -hmm. So cybersecurity had to evolve because we went from a world where apps lived in a data center. We put a perimeter firewall in place. We had a trusted zone and an untrusted zone. We had users in offices and they passed through a VPN tunnel, through that perimeter firewall, access the applications and back. And then apps moved to SaaS, um, you know, uh, users dispersed everywhere, of course, post COVID, like everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> and, and then even with Kubernetes and other things that have happened, the applications themselves disintegrated. So like there is no perimeter anymore. And so I think, Cybersecurity is completely different now than it was when I started my career, you know, 20-ish years ago. 20-ish, yeah, exactly. I 100% agree. It's definitely uh, shifting every which way in that. Uh, and chat, you know, I make this engaging chat. What have you noticed? I know many of you don't have 20 years, but some of you have entered recently in the last five years. The industry changes dramatically. So chat, share in um, in the chat, if you would, what, you know, what pivotal changes have you seen? I'd love to uh, catch those and get your perspective as well. So Craig, you know, technology and awareness has improved over the years, no doubt. Uh, but we do continue to struggle with the evergreen challenges in cybersecurity that professionals continue to face. Like, um, there's technical like patching, operational over permissioning users, misconfigurations all over the place, like domain admin, daily drivers happen quite more often than they should. Uh, what are your thoughts on like why these evergreen problems exist? Cause it's, if you go back, right. And watch like a video from 2014, it's like, we've got to get the patching underway. And then you go back to 2011. It's like, we got to go get the patching underway. Like, you know, wh why can't we solve these evergreen problems, man? Yeah. I mean, we solved them this morning. I don't know if you saw the announcement, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we'll be looking at that in a little bit. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think I think there's there's two things. One, like, you know, because we have so much time spent on these legacy problems, like I, I spent a part of my career on the network side more than the security side. And I was part of inventing SD-WAN, right? Um, and one of the things that people thought when SD-WAN came to the forefront was, you're, you're automating away network administrators. And of course, we know now that that's not true. We were just freeing up network administrators to focus on what's really important. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have these compounding problems of not having enough cybersecurity professionals in the world. So like, if you're listening and you are thinking about this career, like greatest career ever, but also mm -hmm. we spend so much time on the same old problems, patching and segmentation and upgrades and things like that, that even the professionals that we do have, we don't have enough time to focus on what's coming next. What's the next big threat? How do we drive innovation? And I think that's really held us back. Yeah, 100%. And um, I, I just saw it in mod chat. I didn't know if I saw it in main chat. So there's two chats going on. But um, did you just like humbly introduce that you invented SD-WAN? <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. I mean, is that one of your 19 patents? It is. Oh yeah. my God, bro. Take a lap. That's sick. <laughs> like I might, like if I invented SD WAN, I might just like hang it up. Like, you know, like get a very large mural. So when you walk in my house, it just, it's like me holding the patent and, and just call it a day. So congratulations. That's phenomenal. Oh, so cool, man. Um, okay. Well, if you have any questions for Craig, uh, I told you he was knowledgeable on the way in, but now I think Craig has just reinforced that statement. Uh, so drop your questions in chat and we'll get them to him. So uh, shout out to Cisco for sponsoring the episode today of Simply Cyber Live that Craig is being brought to. I genuinely appreciate that. Craig, let's pivot to a more novel and more modern cyber threats. 
that we are dealing with in the trenches on the regular, right? A lot, a lot of folks in chat are practitioners um, across, you know, different levels, you know, uh, you know, early career, mid career, late career, also operational. So like, you know, senior SOC uh, analyst handling the big problems, GRC people, vulnerability management. So we've got a really diverse group in here. Um, with your experience as like a vice president and a chief technology officer at Cisco Security, and as a longtime practitioner, uh, share your perspective with us on the current state of like cyber threats today and the innovations developed to counteract with them. Yeah. So first, Jet Sui, do go to college for cybersecurity, best career. I, I said that already. Definitely still worth it. Nice. Um, I think, you know, we think about AI in a lot of different ways recently. But if you think about the way that attacks tend to happen, so a couple of things have happened over the last like decade that have really changed the game. And the first is cryptocurrency. And people don't really necessarily attribute that to cybersecurity in the way that they should, because what cryptocurrency did was create a way to monetize cyber attacks that had never existed before, an untraceable way to monetize cyber attacks. And we have like big groups like Lockbit that have like literally made their name in doing this, like, you know, doing ransomware attacks and things like that. And while everybody freaks out about zero day attacks, I think what, what groups like Lockbit have figured out is that it's much easier to just look at a CVE that comes out, look at the patch that came out, reverse engineer the patch and go look for the easy targets because you've already taught me by telling me how you fix the exploit, yeah. taught me how to exploit it. But now you bring Gen AI into this. And if you think about if I'm a black hat, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to look at the list of CVEs coming out. I'm going to find the patch. I'm going to reverse, reverse engineer it. I'm going to write code to exploit it. I'm going to find who's susceptible and I'm going to attack them. I can do all of that with Gen AI now. And so the window of time from announcement to exploit is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And so that's really at the forefront of, of what's going on right now, right? There's there's a company in the US that just paid a $22 million ransom yeah. to unlock their data. And that is like insane. That's that's more than the cybersecurity budget of almost every company that I know. Yeah. Oh, hands down, <laughs> hands down more than the budget for sure. And uh, you know, you know, two things. One, I thought AI was going to be like your future problem, uh, but apparently that it the AI is here, it's not coming. Um, and I want to I want to bring this up too. Like I, I told you this before, many of you were in chat this morning, um, kind of along the lines of what Craig was just saying. Researchers are demonstrating that they can feed security advisories directly into ChatGPT right now and get it to pump out exploits. Now there might be some jailbreaking. Obviously, um, we aren't 100% clear on which advisories and which exploits. You know, to what level, right? It's not necessarily like a no-click, zero-day Pegasus level spyware, but but, you know, Craig, is this kind of what you're referring to when you're talking about the speed from vulnerability disclosure to exploit in the wild? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if I can use GPT-4 and we've got GPT-5 coming, right? So like yeah. who knows what's around the corner, then I've shrunk that window down tremendously. I, and, and actually, you know, we announced HyperShield this morning. One of the interesting things about that announcement is that we use GPT-4 to create protections against the exploits. So almost the same way the attackers are reverse engineering the patch to exploit it, we're reverse engineering the patch to protect against it. So you've got like attackers and defenders using the same AI techniques in a race against each other. Oh, I love that. So, uh, okay, so just to kind of like, you know, I guess pull the thread with this one, Craig, um, you know, obviously it's already happened. We're already talking about AI, like AI, I, I honestly, I, I can't go to a conference. I can't go to a um, you know, frankly, anywhere <laughs> without AI sucking the oxygen out of the room. Um, I know you talked about how it's being used today by threat actors and stuff, but either offensive or defensive, how do you how do you see like AI and, and really machine learning uh, behind that shaping strategy for cyber leaders? Yeah, I mean, this is the biggest transformation since the smartphone, right? And I think GPT-3 was kind of like the iPhone moment for AI and, the, and you know, in the way that the first iPhone was the smartphone revolution because mm -hmm. BlackBerry is kind of like a niche thing. And then iPhone came along and everyone saw the power of what a smartphone could do and really started to believe it. And I think 
GPT-3 brought the same thing to Gen AI. Once I could touch it and feel it and experience, experiment with it, it went a long way towards building consumer trust in AI. Now, of course, there's still a lot of scary things around AI and things like that, but it really changed the game in terms of people's perception of it. And, and what we're seeing now is just the start of this first set of products that was built from scratch using AI, right? And, uh, and, and I think that's completely different than bolting AI, AI onto an existing solution. So if you think about like, everyone's got an AI assistant, every website you go to has got a chat bot now, right? Like everybody's trying how to figure out how to add AI on top of what they're doing. But what you're seeing now, like with HyperShield is, we didn't even start designing this product until after GPT 3.5 existed. Like we, we were a long way down the Gen AI revolution. And so we took a blank sheet of paper and said, what are the hardest problems to solve? And can this help us solve them in a way that's never been possible before? And I think you're gonna continue to see more and more like mind blowing innovation that comes as a result of that. Yeah, so let, let's do another poll and get Craig's thoughts and obviously chat. I wanna, I wanna get you on this one. So Craig, uh, the question's directly for you to answer, but chat, please vote in the poll. What do you believe is going to be the most critical factor in strengthening cybersecurity defenses against modern threats? And your options, Craig, uh, and I, I think I might know where you go with this one, enhanced AI and ML tools like leveraging advanced AI for predictive analysis and such, human expertise and uh, continuing education, so investing in the, in the workforce, or stricter requirements and uh, policies and regulations, so like legislating it and having government leaders intervene and kind of put controls, whether it's export or use controls. What, what do you think, given those three options? Um, I don't. Can I pick two because um, <laughs> just two of them go hand in hand, right? Because Sorry, I think, sure, I mean, like AI is is obviously the game changing technology. AI allows us to react much faster than we ever could before. It allows us to do things that are just transformational, like things we used to write code for before that we don't write code for now. It's it's absolutely mind blowing to me, even as someone, and, and I'm a coder, like I have been my whole career in every role I've held, I've never gotten hands off keyboard, but there are so many things that we can do using generative AI that don't require us to write code. Like I wanna build a protocol dissector. I can feed a protocol spec into GPT-4 and I can get the code to dissect that protocol and I can turn things around much more quickly, right? So that's huge. Like that is unbelievably huge, but it doesn't eliminate the need for humans. So AI is great for two things, for stopping known bad things very quickly, for allowing known good things very quickly, and then for taking the gray area, which is honestly very big, and giving human administrators a prioritized list of what they need to deal with. Because we're still, as human experts, required to anal anal analyze that, that gray area and help both train the AI and inform the AI of decisions it can't make, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. And um, I, you know, I, I agree with you. I feel like it's really a tool to enable. Um, I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of uh, Mustafa Suleiman and his, his vision for, um, or philosophy around AI and, and, and kind of the it's going to take our jobs thing is, is not necessary. That's kind of been debunked. Every technology that automated things, it just freed up people to do other things. Yeah. Um, so, so that's basically been it. I'm going to look at uh, chat again, AI ML uh, leading the way at 60%. So thank you uh, chat for that. All right, uh, Craig, let's turn our uh, vision looking forward. All right. Cause uh, we had a question in here. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up on chat and then I'm going to ask you the question because um, it ties hand in hand with what M Siraji says here around emerging threats and organizations have. So, um, okay. So if you're just joining us, I want to preface this, right? Craig is helping us investigate how to combat modern cyber threats presented by Cisco. Now looking forward, Craig, talk to us about uh, like potential future cybersecurity challenges, like in the evolving nature of digital threats, like you can go anywhere you want. You've got, you know, unlimited, you know, fiction writing capabilities here. Where are we going? What are the emerging threats? Uh, I mean, I think so there's, there's a million areas to go into, but I, I think like, let's talk about one thing that's super critical, which is that almost all of the cybersecurity products that exist on the market today, they rely on being in the network in between a user and the application they're accessing, doing man in the middle, 
and decrypting the session and then applying security techniques to make sure nothing malicious is happening in there. This is SSE, this is firewalls, this is like almost everything that exists on the market. But we're quickly moving towards a world with QUIC, with TLS 1.3, with post-quantum encryption that we're not gonna be able to do man in the middle anymore. So imagine a world where everything is end-to-end -end encrypted from the user to the application and my firewall and my SSE is completely worthless at stopping a threat. <laughs> that is really, really scary, right? If you don't think of a new way that you're gonna approach and tackle this. And so I think that is the number one thing that should be scaring people, that the techniques that exist today for 99% of the security we do will not work yeah. very soon. And we know this. It, it like I don't know if this is a good example or not, but based on what you're saying, and I hadn't thought about that particular um, argument yet, so I'm just you know kind of mulling it over and thinking of it. It's it is um, a scary proposition, and the first thing that comes to mind is um, kind of like the the Ottomans and like having horseback rider with a saber. They were like the weapon system of the day. Like if you had a horse and a saber, you were gonna cruise through any army, and then if you go up against gunpowder. Like, see you later. Like, you're, you're, it, it, it is, it does not work. You will fail miserably. Uh, so is that kind of a, you know, it's, it's kind of a more warlike, uh, par uh, parallel. But I mean, that, that's basically what you're saying is like the mechanisms, the tools, the, the weapons we have, the weapon systems will be ineffective. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a great analogy. You mentioned I was in the army before. I feel like cybersecurity yeah. is the new military frontier. Like, we have, we have nation states doing a lot of these big attacks, right? Like, this is, part of if we think about the wars that are going on right now cyber attacks are part of the actual tactics that nation states are taking against each other so i think your your technology to war analogy is actually really really apt in that sense and i think you're right like we we need the right weapons to combat what the attackers are doing well thank you craig I, any compliment coming from you i'm actually i'm gonna especially like an intellectual compliment i'm gonna take that and uh put this as like a little TikTok or something just a short just you complimenting me over and over again so uh craig at cisco you're you're directly involved in innovation at the forefront of cybersecurity. tell us how craig right in your own words how do you how do you see the future of like innovation right you've you've already talked about like what the problem is going to be. These controls aren't going to work, right? Like, so like, how do we innovate? How do we fix? Like, you know, tell us it's going to be okay, Craig. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Okay, um, excellent. I mean, Thank you. We got, we, got, we got a lot of smart people working on these problems, right? So um, I, I think, you know, we're moving away from, like I said, we're moving away from a world of crossing a perimeter to a world where, network and security come together and security becomes intrinsically embedded in everything we do end to end. So just like we're encrypting traffic end to end and not letting someone inspect it, that means that we need security running end to end and make it part of that same tunnel. Someone in the chat earlier said like, uh, you know, re networking resonated more with me than cybersecurity in terms of studying. Those two fields are collapsing. And I think you know, a few years from now, you won't think of networking and cybersecurity as being different areas. You will think of them as being intrinsically linked. And that's one of the things that attracted me to Cisco because obviously Cisco is the biggest networking company in the world, but it's trying to pivot to cybersecurity. And it is like the greatest opportunity for me to capitalize on that intersection that we see coming. Yeah, it basically can enable you to uh, innovate freely and with, you know, and, and solve probably some of the harder problems, right? Because uh, you guys have access to all those challenges. Um, yeah, I, have, I absolutely love that. Um, so since we're talking about the future, which I love doing, uh, let's get everyone's thoughts with another poll. This Everybody, this is our final poll of the day. So, you know, if you're not enjoying the polls, this is it, right? So Craig and chat. Craig, which area do you think is going to be the most pivotal in defining cybersecurity strategies against emerging threats, right? So a lot of new tech coming out. So we have quantum computing. Um, that's certainly going to disrupt things. We've got IoT security, which has been around for a while, but I feel like it's becoming more ubiquitous, more pervasive. 
And then international cyber legislation. So like, you know, different countries come into terms on standards and normalizing uh, different things. So what, what, what do you think is a pivotal area for defining cyber strategies against threats? Yeah, so I don't think it's any of those. <laughs> um, okay. I think that I mean I think there's a couple there's a couple key areas, right? One is how are we going to use AI to mm -hmm. stay ahead of the attackers as defenders? Because integrating in the network is fine, and that that addresses some of the visibility gaps we have today. But we have to also address the agility gaps that we have. And I think the other one is identity, right? Because like yep. seventy four percent of ransomware attacks today come from stolen credentials or some other type of identity impersonation. And a lot of what we think about today has been around that problem, human identity, how to identify a user, how do I do things like that? But there's a lot other types of identity that are really important. And, and I like to say, like, if we think of the classic firewall five tuple for writing a rule, we think about like IP port protocol, right? And source and destination side. But I think in the future, in the very near future, we're gonna have a new five tuple, which is truly identity-based, which is like user identity, device identity, network identity, application identity, and data identity that really allow us to understand every aspect along the way and assign individual risk scores to everything that's happening so that we can make much more intelligent decisions about what we should allow, what we should deny, and what we should push to humans to help us advise on, on what we should be doing in these more, more complicated places. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So, so two things. Uh, one, uh, just to get it out of the way, uh, I came up with these polling questions and for the, for the answer not to be any of the three is absolutely savage. I will not be putting that on a TikTok reel on repeat, uh, unfortunately. Gosh, uh, Craig, I, I do love your, uh, your, your, <laughs> your honesty though. Um, the other <laughs> The other thing is, it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, there's this this concept that many of us are familiar with in the industry called zero trust architecture. And what you're saying is basically, instead of it being like a cute like buzzword for 2021, it we need to like take it seriously and migrate in that direction. And I know there's executive orders to say do it, but like it needs to be realized, implemented, and made normal, right? Yeah, and and it needs to be ubiquitous, right? Like. You know, I was telling folks here today um, at our at our launch event for HyperShield, like one of the things that I hate the most about zero trust network access is that we treat it as a replacement for remote access VPN. And so if I'm <laughs> off the network, I use ZTNA to do user to app, least privilege and access my application. And then as soon as the network detects that I'm behind a corporate SSID or something, ZTNA gets turned off and I just get access to whatever I want. And that's not zero trust, right? We it's not it's not remote access. It's zero trust network access. It should not matter where I am. We should be thinking about least privilege, end-to-end -end encryption, all of these things as just an intrinsic part of everything we do to keep people safe. Uh, that is a very uh, honest and real and also hilarious observation. Um, it it makes me think honestly of like. Basically, cloud, if you look at cloud computing nowadays, like if you actually realize cloud, it's it's awesome and it's a force multiplier and you can scale and elastic and everything. But when cloud first came out, people just like lifted their data center up and put it up in the cloud and like they didn't get any of the benefits. And they're like, oh, this didn't save any money. It's like, yeah, you're not using it correctly. It, it sounds like the same thing with zero trust. Like you got some old, not old, but like, you know, some sysadmin who's in charge of the zero trust and like, oh, yeah, just... Just uh, you know, get them in here, and you know we'll do it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh By the way, God. someone in the chat said if Cisco has ever thought of pairing up with Cisco, and I yeah. think that's the guy who made the thong song, and I'm like just old enough to really, really resonate with that. So I think it's a great idea. Oh well, thank you. That's actually a question from the haircut fish. I, it, it was <laughs> silly. A haircut fish is our resident meme maker. He makes custom <laughs> memes for the channel every week. So uh, shout out. You, you might even end up on, you know what? Uh, haircut fish. I think like the savage animated GIF, but it's Craig just savagely burning me with that poll question might be a good one. Uh, if you're, if you're asking for inputs. Jetsui, I don't know if I should be advocating other businesses, but Code Academy is a great place to start. Go take Python beginner courses on Code Academy. That's a great thing. Someone talked about joining late into this industry. I got my computer science degree when I was 31. Like, it doesn't matter. Just this is the future. 
get on the wave whenever you're ready to get on the wave. Awesome. Oh, dude, that's inspiring. Um, okay, so let, let's pivot, um, uh, Craig. We're right at five o'clock, so 30 minutes into a 60-minute thir- show. And um, I know HyperShield is phenomenal, right? Let's, let, I'm going to bring this up here as I, as, I get this, uh, as I get this going. Okay, guys, this is from this morning's news. This thing just dropped like it was hot. Um, so listen, we've covered Evergreen Cyber Challenges, Emerging Threats today. Cisco released in the news today, HyperShield, right? You guys have seen it. We talked about it earlier with the intent of embedding security into the data center fabric autonomously and addressing the challenges of exploit protection, segmentation, and upgrades. Now, Craig, share with us, what is this new tech from Cisco? What are the key features? How will it impact security operations once people get a hold of it? All right, let's see how fast I can do this. Um, Okay, here we go. HyperShield, so me and my team created HyperShield uh, to completely reinvent cybersecurity in the age of AI, right? And and like I said, this is the first product I've got to work on where I started with knowing that generative AI was available, knowing the capabilities it had and thinking about how we take that forward. But there's a couple other technological advancements that have happened recently that are, are key here. One is eBPF. So if folks don't know what eBPF is, it's a way to securely extend the functionality of the kernel at runtime. So no longer recompiling a kernel or building a kernel module, I can do just-in-time compilation of code and extend the functionality of the kernel. And then we've got like hardware accelerators and all this cool hardware that's going on. And so what we've done is we built an agent using eBPF. We said, what if we could wrap users' entire applications in eBPF? So instead of... (laughs) Instead of dropping the ball, like Jerry just dropped whatever he dropped. And I just I just of, knocked a, a complete uh, bottle of water onto my wall and everything, but we're good. Hey, Craig, I'm going to let you go full tilt just so you can really explain this to everyone. Okay, cool. So uh, instead of relying on just networking, like NetFlow data, like we have classically to try to do cybersecurity, what if I could wrap my entire application in this thing called eBPF? And now I know not just network traffic, but I also know every function call, every system call, every disk write, every database write. And I put that and build an application dependency graph. So I know every dependent library, every every file, every database that your application requires. And then I can take that graph and apply AI to it and do three things. I can one, I can auto generate micro segmentation rules to stop lateral movement. So instead of a human, analyzing the application and trying to craft rules to limit illicit actors from making lateral movement, I can learn how an application behaves and automatically limit them. Second, I can map the libraries that I find inside the application to known vulnerabilities that exist, and I can block them automatically using eBPF, because eBPF can be observability and it can also be enforcement. And third, I can match against any pattern of malicious behavior. So like in cybersecurity, we talk about IDS IPS a lot and using network-based signatures to match things. But what if I could match any type of malicious behavior an application did, privilege escalation, remote code execution, SQL injection, anything that an application does. And I could make it like VDS VPS, we like to say like vulnerability detection and vulnerability protection because it's way more than just networks. All of those things, super transformative in the way that I would block threats. But I still, I can't put eBPF everywhere, right? So as great as that agent is, there are legacy workflows, there are mainframe workflows, there are IoT and OT devices where I can't put eBPF. So I still need some sort of firewall or a network security appliance that I'm gonna gonna pair with this. But the challenge we have in those appliances today is that they're really, really hard to upgrade, right? So I think, In the last couple months, we've had some very high profile vulnerabilities disclosed and some firewall vendors that exist. And one of the challenges is it's really hard to upgrade those firewalls. And we talked earlier about, you know, people using Gen AI to identify vulnerabilities and exploit them. There was a vendor that released a a critical like 9.7 vulnerability last June. And a month after the patch was released, 60% of their firewalls hadn't been upgraded. And we're talking about internet facing perimeter firewalls. So that's pretty terrifying. So Mm -hmm. the other thing that we've done is inside those appliances, we're actually running two versions of the code in parallel so that when a new software release comes down, 
we can actually mirror traffic between both versions. So basically create a digital twin of the situation. We're actually taking every customer's production traffic on every single enforcement point and mirroring it through the primary data plane, which is running their production traffic, as well as this digital twin, and then using AI to make sure that the new version of code will work for your specific type of traffic and your specific set of policies and your specific set of features so that when you upgrade, we just do this simple Kubernetes style blue-green deployment where we move one flow at a time over and with zero downtime, we can upgrade you from the old version to the new version. So now I've got something that can find known vulnerabilities and stop them immediately, find unknown vulnerabilities and stop them immediately, and can automatically update your firewall with zero downtime. That's like a huge number of threats that we've stopped. And on top of that, it automates the process of segmentation. So if threats do get in, lateral movement is locked down as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack there. And, and chat, I know earlier today you had a lot of technical questions, so we can get into that. Uh, just drop them in, chat. There's so much to unpack. So one, one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask about um, is you mentioned this uh, detecting un unreleased or you know unpublished undisclosed vulnerabilities vdvp you had referred to it as so are you saying that you're using the technology to also kind of like basically uh, almost white hack or excuse me white hat view the code the, the like looking for uh different types of uh weaknesses and vulnerabilities that may might be there and then I mean, obviously you can't change the source code of the application. So, I mean, are you are you making compensating controls and is there some type of uh, back channel to the vendor around disclosure? Like is, is Cisco gonna be popping out CVEs like all over the place in 2025? Yeah, I mean, so Cisco already does pop out CVEs. We've got Talos, we've got 500 security oh, true. researchers. I, I do love Talos, um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so absolutely, right? We We are using AI to find vulnerabilities. We're also integrating with vulnerability scanners that exist. So imagine you've got Qualys or Wiz or, or any other vulnerability scanner plugged in your environment. It reports to HyperShield that there's a vulnerability. We check our database to see if there's a compensated control. If there is, we can instantiate it right in eBPF in a minimally invasive way, like a very targeted, targeted patch to block the vulnerability from being exploited, right? And then once you upgrade, we pull it out automatically. But if we don't have a compensating control already developed, we try to use generative AI to automatically create one, just back to your GPT-4 example earlier, right? So can AI reverse engineer and immediately create a patch for this vulnerability we found? And if not, then once again, we hand it off to folks like Talos and ask human security researchers to reverse engineer the vulnerability and create a patch. And so like in February of this year, I'll give you a human example of this, just to show you how easy it is once you have the framework in place. There was a really big remote desktop vulnerability lots of people probably heard about. It was disclosed privately on the 13th, publicly on the 19th. On the 22nd of February, CISA confirmed that it was exploited. My team, when we got the private disclosure, within 15 minutes, we had a compensating control deployed in HyperShield for this. So oh, wow. we have shrunk the amount of time, obviously with if AI can generate, it's even faster. But even in the human case, we're talking about minutes mm -hmm. from disclosure to preventing the exploit of the vulnerability. And then as soon as you upgrade that RDP application, we pull that compensating control out automatically. So we've completely changed the game in terms of how quickly you can react to vulnerabilities. Yeah, I, I love that. And another thing that I love that you do, uh, Craig, because I, I'm a GRC person, right? I came up in CISO and everything. Like, you like put the patch in place, put the compensating control in place, give them access, whatever, uh, break the glass, emergency access, but no one ever comes behind and removes the access or removes the compensating control or, or it sunsets the application that was there just as a temporary fix. And I hate that. It's like, it's it's infuriating because then it becomes critical business infrastructure somehow. And, and we got to deal with that. So I love that you guys are uh, make, you know, basically removing it uh, part of that. So uh, I know that this is all automated. There, there's a lot of questions in yeah, chat. There's a lot of questions in the chat. I mean, so two good ones. Do you yeah, test uh, it in a vanilla environment first? We test it in our digital twin first to make sure that it's not going to disrupt the operation of the application. 
part of the power of the digital twin is we can not only test software in it, we can test policies in it as well. Someone asked if we use Kenna. Kenna is now called Cisco Vulnerability Manager. My VP hat says I have to say that. But <laughs> yes, uh, Talos, Kenna, Panoptica, those are all Cisco tools that are feeding into this. But then, like I mentioned, Qualys and Wiz and, and all those industry tools as well. We're also training our AI on MITRE data, NIST feeds, everything that we can get out there about that information. Uh, Siraji wants to know about, you know, more sensitive environments or segments of sensitive environments like medical and, and healthcare and stuff like that. How, how's HyperShield handle, you know, OT or, or those, you know, those kind of environments? Yeah. So the, the, um, I mean the, the initial version of this, the launch version of this, everything's running in the cloud, but even though it's running in the cloud, we have completely separated the management plane where you just do configuration and the control plane, which is where graph analysis and, and other things happen. And so. What we're going to do is enable uh, users in sensitive environments to move the control plane on premises. So part of the announcement was around our partnership with NVIDIA. And one of the cool things NVIDIA Morpheus AI framework allows us to do is move AI code that we're running from the cloud to on-prem GPUs from NVIDIA. So you'll actually be able to do all of this analysis on-prem in a GPU without exfilling any of that data off-prem. So if you have a very sensitive environment, it can't be completely air-gapped because we have cloud-based management, but you don't actually have to exfil any of your data or, play, or pay cloud ingestion costs. We'll give users the option of just paying the CapEx expense for a GPU and then do this entirely on-prem. Yep. And I, I just threw casually Joseph's questions up because it kind of aligned with what you were just saying, just so people go back and watch. Um, I, this one, I think you already mentioned around making sure the patch is generated is actually secure. Um, I think this kind of speaks to the digital twin uh, piece, right? Yeah, it, it speaks to the digital twin. Obviously, there are other things, right? Like different CVEs have different levels of severity. But if you look at the first three months of this year, there were 7,000 CVEs publicly disclosed. So that spans a long gamut of different types of attacks, different types of sensitivity. For the most sensitive attacks, we actually recreate them in the lab and make sure that things are working properly because like the next log4j, right? That's worth standing up an environment and making sure that we've got it 100% secure. Um, and that's to the power of Cisco and our 500 re security researchers that we have. But for a lot of these, we're able to use AI to generate them, digital twins to test them and, and, and address it there. And, and actually one of, our, one of our early customers who's already purchased this, even though it's not generally available yet, is one of the largest healthcare providers in the US. So it is absolutely not not yet for hospitals, James. It is absolutely yes for hospitals and for financial services. And actually the most sensitive environments are the places that are looking to deploy this first, because those are the places where cyber threats have the greatest ramifications, whether it's financial loss or or literally the loss of life in the case of, of hospitals and patient care. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great point. It's almost like, you know, um, counterintuitive to what you might think like, oh, let's start with the safe ones. But uh, really, you know, I, I could imagine that there are financial services companies that um, were knocking at your door, or you probably have strategic relationships with that, we're like, oh yeah, like we'll go first. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so casually, Joseph just wanted to say, and then I, I would love to get a demo. Um, just in the interim until HyperShield can be everywhere. Um, do you think that learning, you know, um, end user like behavior analytics would be helpful in the defense against AI based attacks? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. So I, d I talked earlier about identity and identity means not just identity, but also behavior and how we map behavior to identity, right? Like one of the cool things about humans is that while it's very hard to classify the behavior of a human because we're very random, it's also very easy to classify the behavior of a human in terms of the things they do every day. So like me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge football fan. I go to the NFL subreddit all the time on my computer. I I go to ESPN.com all the time on my computer. Like there's a bunch of things that I do when I'm working that make it very clear that this is Craig probably not working as hard as he should and reading about football <laughs> when he's on the job, right? And, and so there are 
ways, even if I can't definitively predict everything that I'm going to do when I log into my computer, there's a lot of clues that you can give me that tell me this is actually Craig and this is not someone imperson impersonating Craig, right? And so I think absolutely very, 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 very important. Who's your team, Craig? Uh, it's the New England Patriots. Which yes, used to sir! Which yes! Which is which is um, not as exciting as it was a few years ago, but I'm still diehard. That's okay. We got the draft. We got the draft, Craig. We got the draft. <laughs> we got you a know? new quarterback coming. Michael Penix, come on, Michael Penix, <laughs> come on down. All right. Oh, dude. So, hey, Craig. Let's. You know, we've been talking about it. It's it's epic. I I I I even like you more now, Craig. This is great. I've been getting so much heat from everybody everywhere all the time because I don't live in New England anymore. Uh, let's do a demo and show people. Like, you know, a little bit behind the scenes of like what this Hypershield thing can look like. Yeah, I'm from Amherst, Mass. So shout out to whoever's from New England in the chat. Oh, right on. Got my bachelor's from UMass Amherst. Oh, how about that? Bro, world. like we're BFFs. <laughs> I love it. Let's bring it on stage here. What are we looking at, Greg? All right, cool. So uh, Hypershield, while it's a new product, we didn't introduce yet another console. We're trying to move much more to a platform approach at Cisco. So this is integrated directly into Cisco Defense Orchestrator, where we already cloud manage our firewalls and our multi-cloud defense. So we've got here in Cisco HyperShield, uh, a system where we've got one of our virtual firewalls with its dual data plane running. We've got one of what we call our Tesseract security agent, which is that agent that's using eBPF to monitor a couple of workloads. Uh, if you don't know Tesseract, it's a four-dimensional representation of a cube. So we thought like Kubernetes is a, is a cube and if this is a 4D cube, we're gonna do things that you never even dreamed were possible with Kubernetes in security. So while this is running, it's learning about your system and you've got Cisco developers that are writing code to make it better all the time, right? CI/CD bringing it down to the, to the shadow data plane. So if we refresh this, we'll see a couple things. We'll see that there's a new version of code that's currently testing in our environment. And we'll see that a critical vulnerability with a CVSS score of 7.5 has been a, has been identified in Apache 2 running in our environment. So I'm going to walk through two of these use cases. First, the upgrade, and second, the CVE. So we've got this upgrade being tested in the shadow data plane, in that digital twin, completely transparently. You can see the list of, of past versions we've tested below. Um, of course, in GA, these version numbers will get a lot prettier than these hashes. And what you see is this version actually failed in this customer's environment. And it failed for a bunch of reasons. Maybe one of the most alarming ones, that memory grew by 8.76%. And that's obviously looks really bad. And so we've got a very low confidence that this will work in your environment. So we're actually gonna show the result is an error and we're gonna report a bug automatically back to Cisco. So no need to open a tech case and provide diag bundles and all that. We've already been alerted of the failure that happened on the system. And so some developer at Cisco is now hard at work fixing the bug, goes back into the promotion pipeline, and boom, all of a sudden, I've got a new version that's being tested in my environment. Now, the testing goes on over a period of time. How long it takes is really uh, gated by how much coverage we can get in the system, because we build confidence on things like code coverage, diversity of the of the types of traffic that we see, numbers of your policies that have been hit. We're trying to see everything that could possibly happen in your network and how certain we are that things will work. And, and obviously it wouldn't be a very compelling demo if I made you wait 24 hours for testing to complete. So we're gonna short circuit the testing time here. But once we hit 90% or higher on the confidence score, we're gonna tell you that this has been certified by HyperShield that we're, we're very confident that this is gonna work in your environment. We embed release notes directly in here. We give you a list of all of the test cases that we executed and how we've confirmed that this will work in your environment. We show you the difference in policy hits between the old version of code and new version of code. And then you can see that it's, it's pending applying. And then when you hit update now, as I said, zero downtime, not a single packet lost because the flows are running through both the primary and the digital twin. And all we're doing is changing the exit point to be from the primary to the shadow data plane. So within seconds, you're running the new version of code with no downtime. Second thing we have that. here is, is the vulnerability. Remember we found a vulnerability in Apache 2. And 
There's a couple of things we do. We've got an SBOM or software bill of materials. So we know that Apache 2 is present, but that's not enough. We actually used eBPF to make sure that it wasn't only present in the manifest, but it was actually being used actively in a way that it could be exploited by the system. And so we know that this is actively potentially being exploited. It's being exploited in the wild. It's a critical thing for you to fix. And now if you click into what we've got here um, about the vulnerability, we give you a description of what it is. We've got this interactive AI assistant where you can ask questions like, tell me what this is, tell me how you'll fix it. We'll give you reference links. We'll give you lots of cool information. We can deploy it for you automatically. All of the cool things AI assistants can do. But let's actually show this being exploited. So if we jump into this window, at the top, we've got Apache running. At the bottom, we're running Metasploit. And you're gonna see at the top, an extra session get created. That's a process that was spawned when we did the remote code execution attack. And so Metasploit was able to open an interpreter session. And now we're gonna do something nefarious. We're gonna steal Alice's AWS credentials. So I'm in your system, I've exploited Apache, and I've stolen your data. But remember, HyperShield told you we could stop this. So if we go back and click deploy, HyperShield's gonna push a distributed shield to all of your Apache servers that are vulnerable. And within a couple of seconds, that shield is in place. And if we go back to that same server and run that same Metasploit script, after we type the password correctly, <laughs> then you're gonna see that at the top, when that process gets spawned, it's immediately killed because we detected that this was the exploit and we blocked it from opening a new process. And then in the Metasploit window at the bottom, you see that the exploit was completed, but no session was actually created. So you haven't patched Apache. All we've done is using eBPF, we've intercepted that nefarious action that the attacker was taking, and we've blocked the vulnerability from being exploited. And again, once Apache gets updated, we'll actually pull this compensating control out automatically. So that's like a really quick demo of two of the really key features of HyperShield. Yeah, that was very impressive. Uh, Chad, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, someone here saying HyperShield's the GOAT. Uh, again, uh, Craig and his team invented, uh, I guess, I mean, invented is kind of the right word, right? Or created um, HyperShield. I love all this Western Mass love in the chat. We got like Western Mass. We got outside of Springfield. I love it. Oh yeah. yeah, my wife. Uh, I met my wife in Springfield at, at my first job, my first real big boy job ever. Um, so, hey, real quick, while you were talking, and I know this resonates with everybody that's a practitioner in chat right now. When you're talking about, um, like specifically, it did a million different things that are awesome automated. But when you said that you don't have to collect a bunch of like diagnostic information and send it back to the vendor to get help. Literally, this is this is like what went through my mind. Oh. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like I can't think and of the a best better... part is when the like everyone knows this, right? It fail, you do the upgrade, it fails, you gather diagnostics, you send it to TAC, and then they like call you back and are like, "Oh, we forgot to gather all the diagnostics. Could you make it fail again?" Yeah. Like that's the thing that I never want anyone to ever experience again. Oh my God. No, I can't even think of what GIF that would be. It's just like, no, like you're just like <laughs> losing your mind. Like, you know, you, you, like at that point, I feel like you're almost like, you know what? We'll just accept the risk. We'll just accept the <laughs> risk. We'll just accept the risk. Oh my God. So, I mean, Jesus. Uh, or so let me, let me ask you just as a practitioner, the one question that I personally had was like, whenever there's a new technology, you know, it's, it's great. You, you deploy it. It's, it solves a million problems. It's great. But like sometimes there's a um, uh, like there needs to be a human to man the station, right? And or a woman, excuse me, um, or you know a person to man the station. So like, what what kind of engineer uh, requirements is it? Who would be a good fit? Because you know there's a lot of practitioners in here who are probably amped up yeah. about Hy HyperShield. So I mean, so so like one thing is you can let this run in a fully automated fashion, and it can take care of a lot of the things that you spend time on today. There's still, like I said, a whole bunch of gray areas. Like known bad is very easy. Known good is very easy, but gray areas are hard. Mm -hmm. So having the ability to research those gray areas and understand if unusual behavior or anomalous behavior from an application is really good or is actually bad 
that's the kind of thing that we still need humans to for even to just help train the AI. But I think the other important thing is that nobody expects anyone to deploy something on day one and be like, oh, great, AI solved all my problems. I never have to upgrade a firewall again, right? Yeah. Like, so the whole entire system is designed so that it can you can phase in the automation as you're comfortable. So let's say that my change control process for a firewall upgrade is I open a service now ticket when I'm ready to do the upgrade and I attach all the information about it. Well, like with Hypershield, you can say when Hypershield qualifies a new image, open a service now ticket for me and attach release notes and attach your output of your QA that your AI engine has done and tell me how you know it's gonna work in my environment. You can still schedule a maintenance window. It's gonna be a really boring maintenance window because the upgrade's just gonna work, but it allows you to slowly build trust in the system before you start allowing it to take automated action, right? So we say like it's the system that earns your trust because I think that's really important. And I think the, the digital twin plays such a key role because when people tell me, I don't trust AI to write firewall policies for me, I say like, cool, neither do I. That's why we put a digital twin in there. We're not just recommending a firewall policy and saying, cross your fingers and hope it works. Yeah, We're attaching to that a results of in your actual production environment, what will happen if you remove this firewall rule or add this firewall rule. And so you get that visualization that again, the human engineer can go look at and make sure, yes, this actually matches the intent that I expected. And you can actually iterate over policies in this digital twin and fine tune your rules so that when you put them into production, you know exactly what's going to happen. I love it. Um, Tim Roth wants to know if Hypershield has an AI bias built in uh, against Bills fans. Like, is that <laughs> <laughs> Bills fans uh, suffer enough? I don't think they need any more. Oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Lo Lo Heath. Lohith Dathi wants to know, you know, you gave that demonstration of the Metasploit popping into an Apache, popping a shell, uh, kind of looking under the hood. Is it more based on signatures? You know, if you choose a different approach to exploit, how does it work? Yeah, so we, we, we not only train it on CVEs that exist, we also train it on things like the MITRE attack framework, uh, MITRE's common weakness enumerations. So we look for patterns of unknown malicious behavior as well, because we know, like, think of log4j, right? Like, Everyone was like, oh, log4j, we're going to block it with a WAF. And it took like 15 minutes for attackers to figure out how to bypass the WAF rules. So <laughs> layer defenses are super important. Applying a bunch of different techniques to protect it are important. So that compensating control could be a WAF policy, a regex on an API call, and an IPS signature placed in the network enforcement point all at the same time. We're not necessarily relying on just one way of stopping the attack. We're considering that there may be multiple different vectors of exploit. Yeah, that that's wildly interesting. So, as a as an engineer, right, or a security professional, or whatever, like, am I am I logging into the dashboard and seeing all the actions Hypershield took overnight, or is it like a digest or web hooks to a Slack channel or? What, yeah. So what, when what? you when you log in, you see a couple of things. You see everything that either Hypershield did or your human peers did through Hypershield, you mm -hmm. also see a, a prioritized list of what you should care about from a risk perspective right away, right? So there are things that it doesn't know what to do with, right? Like that's the reality. AI can't solve everything. But mm -hmm. one of the challenges, the biggest challenges we have, and this is like the XDR, MDR challenge of, of all time, XDR can give me a million alerts and that's great, but like, what do I do with a million alerts? So <laughs> not only does it stop a bunch of threats that it knows how to stop, but it also gives you a prioritized list based on whether it's present in your environment, whether it's being actively exploited in the wild, and what is the business criticality of the asset that is potentially being exploited in your environment so that you know as a human, what you should be thinking about first, second, third in your day. That's so impressive. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, we're getting close to time, but like, like I know that it's just launched today, right? So it's not like you can run down to your local tech store and pick it up and install it like it's, you know, Windows 95 release day. But um, like, how can, how can, like, can you try this out? Like, do you have to deploy it like fully into your environment? Can you try it on like a segment? Like, like what's the onboarding process? Cause people are loving it. I'm loving it. I just like, what's it look like? So, so GA in August, um, 
So announced today, GA in August. Absolutely, it's intended to be tried very easily. So <laughs> you can choose one application and you can add HyperShield just to protect a single application. You can even add it just in observability mode. So let's say I'm running a Lumio or Gardecore or NSX or something else that is doing some of these functionalities for me. I can deploy HyperShield. I can say, just watch one application or just watch some applications and just tell me if you're finding vulnerabilities that other vendors aren't finding. Yeah. And then you can slowly turn on protections and slowly add more and more enforcement points and literally grow the fabric over time every time you add a new enforcement point into the network. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking uh, of the engineer who's like, all right, I'm going to try this out. Or like, you know, we have a guy named DJ Bisek who's like like 25 years network engineer. He now is in charge of cyber at his place. And I could just see like turning the dials a couple times. Uh, I don't know if this has been the experience with the early adopters, but turn the dials a couple times, kind of nervous. And then just being like YOLO and just like running your arm across the dashboard and turning all the lights on. Like, is that kind of like what you're seeing? Yeah. We we definitely see both types of customers. We see the hyper conservative ones that are like just observability mode. I don't trust anything. And they're like asking the AI assistant a million questions, like prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. <laughs> and we also see the people that are just like, oh, this is cool. I don't have to upgrade anything. Like turn it on. I'm out. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I had weekend plans. I'd love to get to those. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think personally, the number one thing that I'm going to love about HyperShield is like, Craig, I, I've worked in rather large organizations asking for a patch to a mission critical application. And they're like, we only have downtime on Saturday at you know midnight to 3 a.m. And I'm like, OK, fine. Like, I'll take it. Like, I don't like it, but I'll take it. And then coming in on Monday and finding out that the new features release the, the reboots took too long and they 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 couldn't get to the security patches. And I'm just like flipping my imaginary desk and just like, come on, man. You know, so or, or you did the 3 a.m. upgrade, but there was no traffic in the network. And so Monday morning at 9 a.m., the whole network goes down. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or that. Yeah, just it's like, it's like, you know, so uh, personally, just for my own, you know, maybe I'll, I'll have less gray hairs in a, in a slower amount of time. Uh, because of HyperShield and specifically around that. So a lot to get. Is there, um, I'm going to wrap it up, but like, is there like, I've got the news story, but is there somewhere people should go to like, you know, get more information on it? Yeah. So, so obviously just announced today, um, yeah. you know, not coming GA till April. Information is going to start coming out. Watch Cisco Security Space on X or whatever your favorite social media platform is. And you'll start to see information come out. And that's where we'll announce once we have the HyperShield website stood up with white papers and data sheets and all of the, the goodness that we all want to consume. All right. I love it. And I actually, it looks like you do have a Cisco HyperShield website up right now. Uh, oh, wow. I, like they're faster than I even imagined. Yeah. May, they might be using uh, Cisco HyperShield to, uh, to deploy <laughs> it. So I'll drop this link in chat, guys. But um, like Craig said, you know, this is where the information is. I'm assuming that there's going to be more information added to this as the technology, you know, hits GA and gets more uh, mainstream and everything. So I'm going to drop on, that. On blogs.cisco.com, I wrote a super detailed blog about the technical capabilities of this. So definitely check that out. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back and add that in the show notes. So if you're watching this on replay, uh, look in the description below and you can get that. So, all right, Craig, this has been epic. Um, that's going to wrap it up, guys. Fun journey through the past, the present, the future. Um, with our distinguished guest. And I've got to tell you, uh, distinguished, I am really impressed by you, Craig. Not that like you were trying to impress me. Um, chat has been uh, just laying... And by the way, chat, before you blow up on this, it's I'm impressed by Craig and his knowledge, okay? Not that he's a Pats fan. Like that's just a given <laughs> that that's awesome, okay? They're going to say bias and, and subjectivity um, for sure. Um, so we navigated the evolution of cyber threats. We talked about foundational challenges. We talked about how I get frustrated at 3 a.m. patch windows that don't actually do anything for me uh, and how we can shape the defenses to take on tomorrow's vulnerabilities. And we took a, look, a long look at Cisco HyperShield, which was wicked fun. Uh, Craig affirmed the timeless nature of cybersecurity challenges, continuous need for vigilance and adaptation to combat them. Adaptation meaning use the technologies that we have now and at our disposal that the threat actors are using too. It, it's dumb if they have gunpowder and we're still coming at them with a <laughs> you know, samurai sword or whatever, right? Um, and obviously we talked AI quite a bit. 
Chad, I'd love to know. Let us know in your in your uh, in your argument. We've got a Rams fan in Chad who's saying that I'm 100 percent biased. Of course. Uh, what, was your, what was your key takeaway, everybody? What are your thoughts about HyperShield? What are your thoughts about what Craig said? I'd love to see it in chat as we kind of round out the show. Uh, I encourage everybody to connect with Craig. Craig, I assume you're on LinkedIn and active over there. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm active. I'm at egregious on Twitter or X, whatever you call it these days. So like, feel free to hit me up, ask questions. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll link, I'll link that as well. The egregious. I actually think I did find you uh, on Twitter and connected with you. Uh, so that's perfect. All right, guys, don't miss our next episode of Simply Cyber Live, where we're going to be talking to Bryson Bort about Hack the Capital. I don't know if you know about this, Craig, but uh, Bryson Bort's involved with OT and the U.S. federal government, and they have an initiative around, you know, basically it's an invite-only bug bounty program around hacking um, Washington, D.C. Uh, through nonprofits. It's awesome. Um, just everybody knows, programming note, I do not have a, uh, a Simply Cyber Live next Thursday because I'll be in Vegas filming the TV show, but May 2nd, uh, will be uh, where Bryson Bort comes on. So Craig, I want to offer you a heartfelt thank you. Really genuinely appreciate you coming on the show, sharing all your knowledge and invaluable insights and really letting us know um, just about this basically game-changing paradigm shifting tool that's going to be at our disposal pretty soon. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thanks for being a Pats fan. Thanks for all yeah. the great comments in the chat. Uh, I really, I love being here. Uh, it's awesome. I love geeking out about cybersecurity. Oh, well, then we'll have to have you back on because that's pretty much what we do here all the time. <laughs> all right. Special thank you to all of you in the Simply Cyber community, squad members and non-squad members alike. Uh, genuinely appreciate it. It was great to see the emotes come out and everybody engage. Your engagement really is what brings the show to life. Craig and I could have just talked to, you know over coffee and had a great time. Uh, but with you guys here, it just makes it dynamic. It makes it you know just exciting. So I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I genuinely appreciate all of you. And until next time, stay secure. If you enjoyed that content, keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. 